Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm the Jagger Velazian coming up in today's newscast. Iran vowing revenge over the killing of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps commander who was killed in central Tehran. The assailants still on the run. Hamas terrorist organization in a warning to Israel against carrying out the nationalist flag march in Jerusalem next week. And a Jerusalem magistrate's court rules in favor of three Jewish teens who recited a prayer on the Temple Mount. Will this decision affect the status quo agreement? Iran on Monday vowing revenge over the killing of an Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps commander. Details in the following report. A member of the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Quds Force, or IRGC, Colonel Hassan Sayyad Khodayari was assassinated in Tehran on Sunday, the IRGC announced. Khodayari was in his car near his home in central Tehran Sunday afternoon when he was shot five times by two unknown assailants riding on a motorcycle. He died instantly in his car. A manhunt is currently underway for the assailants. According to Hebrew media reports, Kodayari is said to have been involved in planning attacks and kidnappings against Jews and Israelis worldwide. Iranian reports also identified him as a defender of the shrine, a reference to Iranians operating in Syria and Iraq who protect Shiite sites. The IRGC issued a statement attributing the killing to global arrogance, which is a code usually reserved for the United States and Israel. And shortly after the incident, though unclear if related, the ISNA news agency reported that members of an Israeli intelligence service had been discovered and arrested by the IRGC. Meanwhile, Iran responded to the killings on Monday with Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi issuing a statement saying that Iran would avenge Khodayari's death. <laughs> استیصال خودشون رو نشون بدن پیگیری جدی مسئولین امنیتی مورد تاکید من هست و تردید ندارم که انتقام خون پاک این شهید بزرگوار از دست جنایتکاران حتمی است and according to the semi-official Mer News Agency, IRGC spokesperson Ramazan Sharif said Monday that the assassination only strengthens the determination of the elite corps to confront the enemies of the Iranian nation. And a Jerusalem magistrate's court issued a ruling Sunday in favor of three Jewish teens who recited a prayer on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Currently, there is a status quo maintained on the Temple Mount, an informal agreement which allows Jews to visit the holy site but not to pray there. Joining me with more on this controversial ruling is public diplomacy expert and attorney Ran Bal Yoshafat. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. So does this ruling now set a precedent that Jews will now see as a sign to be able to go and pray on the Temple Mount? So on one hand, it is a positive sign for those who believe in freedom of religion for all, including Jews. On the other hand, well, firstly, this is not entirely new. In uh, October 2021, Judge Bilhaya Alom said something similar. And lastly, it is still very vague. Can Jews pray in a group, in a minion? Are they allowed to bow down and pray? Yesterday, Judge Tzion uh, Sahari said that Jews can say the Shema prayer, but today the police detained the person because he bowed. So it's still unclear how much it's going to affect the future. Now, what are the implications of the judge's decision? So I think it's too soon to say. It is, again, one step forward for those who are open to real freedom of religion. But if this ruling is a game changer, my guess is that this ruling by itself is not very significant. Not very significant, but the court is receiving a lot of backlash against this ruling, also from the Israeli police. Can you explain why that's the case? So the argument is that Jews that pray are a threat to the public order and peace. 
I have a very hard time accepting that. Um, the legal guideline is that when you're meant to protect the person who is not violent from the people who are violent, um, and not the other way around. And it is not really clear here, because if Jews who are praying on Temple Mount are certainty for violence, then I don't think the Jews are to, the ones to be blamed. The violent people are those who are responsible for this, and they're the ones who should be arrested, and not those who are praying in the holiest place for the Jews. Now, there's backlash not only from within Israel, but also Jordan speaking out against the ruling, saying it goes against international law. Is this, in fact, the case? I'm sorry, I have no idea um, how they can argue it is against international law. It seems maybe for some people in the world, the mere existence of Jews is a crime, especially Jews who pray, but I cannot really take this, uh, this argument seriously. However, they do have one good solid claim, and that is that on Temple Mount, um, Israel doesn't really have full sovereignty because it's under the Jordanian Waqf. So the lesson that I get from this is this, very different. In Israel, everyone has full equal rights and freedom of religion. Whatever is not under Israeli sovereignty doesn't. So it seems that Jordan is the one that's violating not only international law, but also is violating human rights by uh, not allowing Jews to pray. By the way, not just Jews, also Christians. And yet when Jews do go on to the Temple Mount, which as you say is under Jordanian jurisdictions, what happens when they do in fact go there to pray? So that's a million dollar question because it's not certain. So today they detain a person because that person bowed um, when he was praying. And yesterday, uh, Judge Zion said that Jews are allowed to say the Shema. So on one hand, you can see that um, there is a, a line that says, yes, it's not a crime for Jews to pray on their holiest place in the world. But on the other hand, you do see that they're detaining the Jews because they want to maintain some sort of public order. And what is set to happen now? Because I understand that the prosecution intends to appeal this case. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Today, uh, Deputy Minister of Economy, M.K. Golan, said that it's not up to the court to decide such matters. It is up to the public in the, uh, with the Knesset. And I agree with him 100%. It's just very interesting. It's coming from someone from the Meretz Party who always tries to give more strength to the judicial branch. But I agree. At the end of the day, this is a question of policy. Um, the law, by the way, does not prohibit Jews from praying there. Uh, it's not like the Jews who are praying there are doing something that's not legal. The police has a right to say, we're worried about what will happen if you will pray there. It might cause some rights. And again, in my opinion, that doesn't go with any guideline of any Western legal system. You're not supposed to arrest the person who's not doing anything. You're supposed to arrest the person who's violent and not allowing other people to have freedom of, uh, of religion. But the question is, should this be uh, something that will be solved in the court of law, or should it be solved within the public and in the Knesset? And I think that the letter is the correct answer. In the Knesset. And yet this is such a major decision. And again, as you mentioned, has real implications in terms of, of the status quo. Currently, it's in the court system. Will we eventually see it reaching the highest court? And will we see it perhaps passing over to the Knesset, as you suggested? It doesn't contradict that the, the, the Supreme Court of Israel has two hats. One hat is that if you appeal and then you, um, uh, you want to uh, you disagree with the decision that was made on uh, a Mechozi court, then it goes to the Supreme Court. And the other hat that the Supreme Court has is Bagatz, the High Court of Justice. When that happens is, I mean, if you have a, a, an appeal that's something that's for the whole state or it's something with some sort of um, a constitutional um, colors to it. So that's why you would appeal to that. So it, it doesn't contradict, but at the end of the day, who should decide if Jews should be allowed to pray on Temple Mount? In my opinion, the answer is the people of Israel, which is being represented in the Israeli parliament, in the Knesset. But it doesn't contradict. It can be that it would be a discussion within the Israeli parliament, and they would legislate the law to clarify, even though it's still, that's the situation right now today in Israel, but just to clarify that everyone can pray wherever he or she wants to. And at the same time, someone might appeal to the Supreme Court to say this is a constitutional matter, and we want the Supreme Court to give a decision to say, yes, Jews are allowed to pray wherever they want to. All right, Ran Bal Yoshifat, thank you so much for taking the time to clarify these important points. Happy to be here. Thank you. And in related news, Palestinian terror organization Hamas making threats against Israel over the planned annual flag march set to take place in Jerusalem next week. 
ILTV's Kayla Everlin with the report. One year after Operation Guardian of the Walls, Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh warned Israel on Sunday against carrying out the planned flag march set to take place in Jerusalem's Old City next week. Speaking at the conference marking the anniversary of last year's 11-day conflict, Hania warned the enemy against committing these crimes and acts, and said the organization would resist with all its capabilities. The Palestinian people, led by the resistance, especially those in the West Bank and Jerusalem, will not permit this Jewish Talmudic nonsense to go unanswered, he said in a statement, adding that the Palestinian resistance would not allow Israel's bullying at the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the rest of Jerusalem. As such, he called on his fellow Palestinians to be prepared and ready to defend Al-Aqsa Mosque, he said in a statement. Last week, Israeli authorities decided to allow the right-wing march to pass through Jerusalem's Damascus Gate and through the old city's Muslim quarter, despite the fact that last year the same event led Hamas to fire rockets into Israel, prompting Operation Guardian of the Walls. This year, the march comes as tensions remain extremely high and Israel is in the midst of a terror wave that has seen 19 Israelis murdered, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett responded to criticism and defended that decision to allow the march to pass through the Damascus Gate, saying that he would not give in to Hamas's threats, adding that last year this route was altered and still Hamas responded with rocket fire. And from one flag march to another, after a two-year hiatus, the Celebrate Israel parade held annually in New York City returned on Sunday as pro-Israel supporters marched down Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. This year's theme, Together Again, saw tens of thousands come out in support of the Jewish state. We interviewed Yuval David, filmmaker, host, actor, and activist from New York, live at the parade on Sunday. Hello, Yuval. Thank you for having me. So, first of all, what can you tell us about this year's parade? How many people are marching, and what does it include? I have to say that I'm surprised to see how many people are marching. I didn't really know what to expect. We truly still are in a pandemic. But I have seen tens of thousands of people, more than I expected. And it's just absolutely marvelous to see so many people here marching together to end Jew hatred, to celebrate Israel. Wonderful. Now, the parade is returning after a two-year hiatus due to the coronavirus. How does it feel to bring it back? This parade is returning after a two-year hiatus due to the coronavirus. It feels so great to gather together to celebrate Israel together with all of these people. It's uh, a, wonderful, a wonderful energy is permeating through the air to just see all of the flags of Israel and the flags of America and other branding that pertains to our Jewish community. It's celebratory. It, it perfectly fits that this parade has the word celebrate within it because it's a celebratory mood. Now, aside from support for Israel, what is the message that the parade conveys to New York, to Israel, and to the world? Aside from support for Israel, one of the other messages of this parade is honoring and respecting the connection between the United States and Israel, honoring the connection of the Jewish people, no matter where they are. For example, here in New York City in the United States, honoring the connection of the American Jewish community to Israel. because. Anybody who knows about Judaism and Jewish education also understands that there is no separating Israel from our Jewish identity. And that's really what we're celebrating. Just like people here singing Am Yisrael Chai, we need to celebrate each other. We need to celebrate Am Yisrael Chai to empower each other in order to allow our people to continue. Now, has there been any opposition to the parade this year? Yes, there has been opposition to the parade this year, but truly it's not surprising because it's our usual enemies, our usual haters, whether they call themselves anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, anti-Zionist, or anti-Israel. We all know that it means the same thing. It's all a version of anti-Semitism. So specifically, who are the people who showed up? It's Netoy Kapita, uh, the ultra-Orthodox Jewish organization that is anti-Israel because the Mashiach has come yet, according to them. We also have the pro-Palestinian anti-Israel organizations. We have the other organizations that falsely claim that Israel is a white supremacist apartheid state, which, uh, as you know, uh, or hopefully your audiences know, is, is not a fact. Because the Jewish people, actually, 67% of the Jewish people are considered people of color. 
So there's no way that we can be a white supremacist movement. But look, I diverge because I'm already thinking about how to respond to these different haters. And the truth is, this is the Celebrate Israel Parade. We need to be here together, just like all of these folks behind me, celebrating Israel, coming together in happiness, joy, and unity. Now, we've seen also a rise in anti-Semitism across the United States. How important are shows of support for Israel like this during such difficult times for the Jewish and pro-Israel community? We're in an era where we're seeing a rise of anti-Semitism, hatred of Jews, and we're seeing it out in the open around the world and here in New York City, here across the United States. So to come together, to celebrate together in unity is so very important because if we can step out into the light with love, with unity, with support of each other, I think that's one of the best responses to the hate, which sadly also is stepping out into the light. And just a moment ago, I was walking by uh, an area where we had Palestinian and Arab people who are hating Israel next to Netuwek Pauta, next to other groups who are anti-Semitic. And it seems like they unified in hate. So we need to unify with love. We need to unify with support. And that's one of the great things is here at the Celebrate Israel Parade, we're seeing so many different organizations come together. And it's about time because the only way we can end Jew hatred as a unified movement is if we unify together in a place like this and even beyond the parade. All right, Yuval David from New York, thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to speak with you, especially from here at the Israel Day Parade, all together trying to end Jew hatred. And now, back to Israeli politics. An Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett's chief of staff announced his resignation, the latest sign of trouble for the shaky coalition. The details in the following report. Tal Gansvi, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett's longtime chief of staff, announced on Monday he would be resigning from his position. A statement released by the Prime Minister's office said Gansvi, who had been with Bennett for over a decade, asked to step down from his role in the coming weeks. Bennett thanked his chief of staff for the long years of joint work and said, From the moment I entered politics, Tal was one of the pillars of my public work at all my various stations. The prime minister said he accepted his resignation with sadness but understanding, adding that his wisdom, managerial abilities, and the fruits of his work have been a valuable asset for me. His resignation comes just two weeks after Bennett's diplomatic advisor, Shimrit Meir, announced her resignation set to take effect June 1st. Gansvi was seen as a central figure in Bennett's inner circle as well as within the coalition. Many analysts see his resignation as another sign of instability within the government, which is struggling to stay united after losing its majority, prompted by the defection of member of Knesset Edith Silman to the opposition, also a member of Yamina, Bennett's party. And now, Israel is known as the startup nation and a global leader in the field of drones. Well, Airways offers a software-based artificial intelligence that allows any drone of any type to be part of an autonomous drone fleet and perform multiple tasks in a variety of fields. Joining us now with more on this innovative Israeli technology is Eyal Zol, Airways co-founder and CEO. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So drones are being used across multiple industries, such as commerce, agriculture, even medicine. Why is this, and what does the future of drone technology look like? Well, you know, first, to answer your question in the most simplest way, they're just doing a great job, right? Replacing us as human beings. But I think that uh, the answer lies in that, that the technology for drones has got to a maturity point where they can really prove their significant help and aiding different kind of industries, providing a, a very well and efficient uh, a solution to the market, right? So we take about uh, our drone deliveries, uh, and you know, it, it was a, a vision back then, if you remember that uh, uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon uh, said that by, by 2018, you're gonna see drone deliveries, and it took a bit, uh, quite more time. Looking at today, we see in the US markets, different kind of cities already starting commercial drone deliveries, and they can prove how it is really uh, efficient and a safer way to travel goods compared to other meds, uh, methods of travel. Uh, and you know, that's exactly uh, everything regarding drones. They're already proving their uh, efficient commercial activity in different kind of uh, verticals, such as uh, delivery, inspection, security, uh, and the future is bright, 
right? Because uh, they really bring uh, a very significant effort in order to help us humans just perform our daily jobs in a more safe and efficient way. Okay, now tell us about Airways. I mean, why is your technology so crucial to this market? Right, so Airways is a, a company that is focused on developing what is called the uh, uh, UTM, unmanned traffic management. Basically, uh, we are the one to manage the new skies of drones and even air taxis in the future. Uh, and Airways was founded by ex-Israeli Air Force personnel, myself. I was an air crew for more than 15 years. Uh, and it is known that we bring really a unique global experience on how to manage complex airspace, right? Israel is like very congested in terms of traffic. Uh, and we had a method on how to manage uh, a lot, let's say, uh, many different aerial vehicles in the same dynamic airspace as Israel. We took our know-how and we brought it to the uh, drone ecosystem and we said, well, the problem is that we're gonna have more drones than the traditional aviation uh, traffic can manage. Uh, and what we did, we developed what is known to be the first AI-based UTM. Uh, basically what we do, we try to mimic the traditional aviation where you have the pilots and the air traffic controller. Well, we are the automated controller, uh, which can let different kinds of drones to operate simultaneously in the same airspace uh, safe and efficiently, and by that, you know, really prove the market. Now, you say the future is bright. The global drone market is estimated to reach approximately $50 billion uh, by the year 2026, which is really right around the corner. I mean, what can you tell us about the projections for this industry? Well, I think, you know, the market did its corrections uh, from the hype they had, you know, when the, uh, it first got to recognize drone technology back in the uh, last decade. Uh, decade. And uh, uh, I think the numbers are really more or less uh, uh, getting to be accurate because we see the revenues from the drone market today and we see uh, you know, how it is uh, growing significantly by the years, more countries adopting uh, favorable regulations. Here in the US, they had a lot of changing regulations in order to let companies to start to operate. Uh, so when I look at those numbers and I see the entire ecosystem of drones and I see a lot of companies you know, maintaining their growth, uh, bringing more solutions to the market, uh, I think you know, the numbers are quite accurate and they're just proving that drones is not uh, in a fiction, it's already a reality for different kind of, uh, of verticals. And so it really appears that Airways is sort of the drone traffic control uh, of the future. And are there cities uh, around the world that are, that are gearing up for you know, a pilot of this technology or that that's, it, it's operating in those cities already? Yes, I can say, you know, uh, Airways got recognized globally when we conducted uh, what is uh, known to be the world's largest UTM trial here in Israel. Uh, we started in Hadera and then we moved to Tel Aviv and now we are already in Beersheba and Yerucham and all other cities. Uh, and we've found out that multiple cities globally, in Europe, in the US, in the Far East and even here in the Middle East, have uh, contacted us and said, uh, we are already ready for scalable UTM deployments, right? So, so if you have the solutions and you are the, currently the only one that can support multiple drone operations, uh, we are ready because uh, our cities are looking for, let's say, mature services that can help the citizen get a better you know, uh, service from the municipality. Uh, so there are a lot of customers and the market is ready. Uh, I cannot disclose yet uh, upcoming deployments, uh, uh, but you will see by the end of this year, um, multiple cities in large locations, both in the US and Europe, already gonna start to adopt and you're gonna see a lot of drones flying over your heads. Our part as Airways is exactly to be the company that to manage this congested traffic, right? It's gonna be, it have to be safe, it have to be efficient, it have to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, more efficient than, you know, than traditional traffic today. Uh, and that's what we're working with all of our partners in the industry uh, because we think, you know, that's the next revolution and it's, it's coming, you need to be ready. The next revolution, absolutely. Eyal so thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you again for having me. And now, let's take a look at the weather forecast. A mix of clear and partly cloudy skies expected around the country tonight with lows this evening, averaging around 15 degrees Celsius or 59 Fahrenheit. And tomorrow, we can expect partly cloudy skies with top temperatures reaching 24 to 31 degrees Celsius or 75 to 87 Fahrenheit. That's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel and around the world, Check out our website, ILTV.TV. You can also subscribe to our newsletter and join us on our streaming platform at ILTV+. You can catch that across all your devices. I'm Adar Gavelazi, be well, and thank you so much for watching. Stay informed with the latest Israel news, live programs, culture, kosher cooking, and more on ILTV+. 
Subscribe on any device now and get a free month trial. Go to www.iltv.tv, add ILTV Plus on Roku, or download ILTV Plus from the Apple or Android app stores.